Hello, I'm Tony DeMaria, the editor of Jack, here to bring you the highlights of the March 19th issue. The search for risk factors uh, for coronary artery events and cardiovascular events uh, is one that's never ending. And we have a very nice study in the March uh, 19th issue of Jack that deals with the use of LP little a uh, as well as the LPA gene responsible for LP little a in predicting cardiovascular events, either all events or myocardial infarction in a general population followed in Denmark. Now, one of the advantages of, of taking this database from Denmark was that the follow-up was entirely complete. There was no loss to follow-up. These were general uh, uh, individuals uh, in the country. And they looked at individuals from a very common sense perspective. They decided to take only those individuals who had the highest levels of LP little a and look at that group individuals as to whether or not it conveyed risk for events. And so they selected the 80th percentile level of LP little a. Uh, and in doing that, as a matter of fact, they found they were able to include 20% of the population in this study, so a goodly number of patients. And what they found was that looking at patients in that 80th percentile or above for LP little a, they were able to reclassify approximately 16% of those patients with events uh, over and above the conventional risk factors that we all use. Now, in the entire group, uh, the ability to reclassify patients into different risk groups uh, was a, a, a bit less accurate than in, in those individuals who had events, but nevertheless, uh, still very impressive. Now, the results for looking at the LPA gene for looking at SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms in the LPA genes wasn't as effective, but if you combined uh, the 80th percentile LP little a and SNPs in the LPA gene, one had a very, very good ability to reclassify patients and to predict risk for events. What was very interesting about this study is that LP little a was especially predictive in patients in the intermediate risk category, that is, uh, the 10-year risk rate from 10 to, to 19 percent. So some important and I think useful data, uh, some among many that's forthcoming, uh, would indicate that LP little a is an important risk stratifier, uh, not only for coronary artery disease, but for cardiovascular events. Potential bias in cardiovascular research has recently received quite a bit of attention, and in fact, there's been some data that studies supported by industrial sponsors tend to have a, a slightly higher rate of positive findings than studies that are independent of industrial sponsors. Uh, if this is true, uh, of course, it raises the question as to whether it's inherent in the design of the study itself or whether it relates to some potential bias on the part of the investigators. And so to get at this, some investigators put together a very nice paper we're publishing in Jack that examines the positivity of cardiovascular research studies relative to the degree of financial conflict of interest on the part of the investigators. And to do this, they went to three very high impact medical journals and extracted all the randomized clinical trials on cardiovascular topics, some 500 or so articles. And then they divided those articles into those in which the investigators had claimed the financial conflict of interest and those in which they had not, about evenly split. Interestingly, they classified financial conflict of interest as 
equity uh, uh, in the uh, uh, industrial sponsor or a speaker's bureau or some amount of money directly to the investigator, they did not include the industrial sponsorship of the trial itself. And what they found was fascinating. In fact, when they compared the number of studies that yielded positive results, the, the percentage was identical between those in which the investigators claimed the financial conflict of interest and those in which they did not. So it, it, there was no evidence that financial conflict of interest as claimed by the authors and investigators really led to any difference in the percentage of papers that yielded positive results. And these are fairly uh, heartening results for those of us in, in the research community. Uh, they suggest that, uh, in fact, investigator bias uh, is not nearly as, as um, significant as has been potentially suspected by some sources, and in fact, maybe nearly non-existent. Uh, uh, these data, of course, depend on the investigator's self-reported financial conflict of interest, but nevertheless, uh, supportive data that we can have some pretty good uh, faith in, in the medical literature as it appears today. So a, a number of important articles in the March 19th issue of, of Jack that are of relevance to clinical practice and should make for very interesting reading. 